Society, its members, nor PBS El Paso shall be responsible for the views, opinions, or facts expressed by the panelists on this television program. Please consult your doctor. One in four people die of heart disease here in the United States, and there are many tests today that may be able to show early signs of heart disease and heart issues and treatments truly are better than they ever have been before. And during this next hour, we have experts answering your questions about advanced treatment and heart disease, including treatment, as we said, detection, intervention, and beyond. So give us a call. As you know, this is a live program, and the telephone number to call is 880-881-0013. Um, we have the Hospitals of Providence are sponsoring this program this evening, and specifically, there's a lot of work done in the Sierra Medical Center with the Center of Excellence there, the Cardiology Center of Excellence. And I also want to say a huge thank you to the Texas Tech Paula Foster School of Medicine. Um, we have with us today Lachwin Vo and also John Pinsky. And these are the two uh, medical students who are going to be answering the phones and they are going to bring the questions over our way. So we could not do the show without them. And so thanks very much, guys. I also want to say a huge thank you as we do each and every month, each and every year now for many, many years, 23 years, going on 23 years, to the El Paso County Medical Society for bringing this particular program to you. Good evening, I'm Katherine Berg, and you're watching The El Paso Physician. Thanks again for joining us. This is one of those shows, every time we have a cardiology show, we get so many questions from the audience because it's like knees that hurt and backs that hurt. Everyone's got an issue with their heart, right? There's something that's beating too fast. Is this a heart attack? Is this GERD? What's going on here? So we have a lot of specific questions that are gonna be coming from here this evening, but then people at home get to call in with your questions too, and that's always so, very important and I, I know that we don't have a toy on the table but Dr. Ossie as simplistic as it may seem to you hmm. to everyone at home if you are going to explain what the function of the heart is and maybe go a little bit more into some specifics when we're talking about advanced diseases and now advanced treatments what does the heart do for the body it brings that oxygen etc cetera, etc cetera. but when you're looking at talking to first year medical students, let's say, and the function of the heart, how would you explain that? Well, the main function of the heart, obviously, is to provide oxygenated blood to the entire body. And why well, does the body need oxygenate, o oxygenated blood? It can't I, function without it. Your you brain can't function, your organs can't function, so it, it is necessary. As many of my colleagues, whether you're a urologist or an orthopedic surgeon, they always think that they're much more important, but the cardiac cycle is what provides everything mm -hmm. to the body. So, without of course, a cardiologist would say that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's absolutely true. And so, on that note, I have here as the three of you just just put together. We have Dr. Ossie, Edward Ossie, who is a cardiologist. Then we have uh, Dr. Jose Mendez, Mendez, who's also a cardiologist. And then we have Dr. Hector Flores, who is a thoracic surgeon. So. On that note, with explaining what the heart does, Dr. Mendez, um, how would you describe what you do all day, every day? I know you were kind of joking about what other colleagues uh, do and say, but in general, what you do all day, every day is a little bit different than what Dr. Flores does, correct? Exactly. Okay. Yes, so us as cardiologists, uh, our specialty is actually interventional cardiology, which is a, a subspecialty of cardiology. Uh, we specialize on diagnosing people with uh, or patients with heart uh, disease, mm -hmm. uh, treating them, and also preventing, uh, treating, treating their risk factors for preventing uh, heart disease. So, and that's done bo both in the office and in the hospital. Um, so, so that's really pretty much what we do on a daily basis. Go to the hospital, see patients that are admitted to the hospital, di uh, do appropriate diagnostic testing, uh, figure out what they have, what their, their disease, mm -hmm. and then treat it appro uh, accordingly. Uh, similar thing in the office. Um, as opposed to the cardiovascular surgeon, which uh, Dr. Flores will explain. And he's uh, next. Yeah. And he's next. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we specialize on treating people with what we call medically, with medications, mm -hmm. preventively, but also treating people with uh, catheter-based therapies, okay. uh, like stents or catheter-based 
Okay. And on that note, too, when we're talking about intervention cardiology, we're going to get a lot of questions from the audience that would seem like, okay, if I had an internist on the panel, I would direct it to the internist. So I'm looking at all three of you. Who might that person be? I'm looking at between the two of you. You're talking intervention. But when somebody goes to their internist and says, okay, well, I'm having these issues, and now they get sent to you, who would it be that I ask those questions to? Dr. Ossie? I'm just looking, Dr. Mendez is going, Dr. Ossie. <laughs> <No. laughs> well, I mean, the internal medicine physician, mm -hmm. the internist, mm -hmm. which actually both Dr. Mendez and I have been trained in internal medicine. Okay. But because um, we subspecialized in internal medicine, which is cardiology, there's a branch of internal medicine. Okay. So we went further after our three years of internal medicine to do cardiology. But the primary care physician, internal medicine docs, the primary care physicians, uh, such as family practitioners, are typically the first ones that interact with the patient. Exactly. They're the ones that get all the questions. They get all the right. questions. They yeah. get all, you know, and they're seeing a bunch of patients, and they basically have to look and assess these people as they come in to determine whether or not they think that that patient needs to be further evaluated by a specialist. Okay. And that's exactly along the lines of what I was asking. So we, we'll be getting quite a few of those questions here. Um, so, Dr. Flores, so thoracic surgeon, that includes a lot. It, it right? does. It, it really does. Because I'm thinking, oh, cardiology, but really it includes all kinds of stuff that's going on in there. So, how would you describe to our audience what you do all day, every day? So, um, the, the field of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery is, is, is broad. Uh, we deal with mechanical problems. I think historically, and, and sort of uh, it's being touched on here by, by uh, Dr. Asi and Dr. Mendez, historically there, you would have internal medicine uh, physicians that would then subspecialize into, into cardiology. Historically for us as cardiothoracic surgeons, we would train as general surgeons first. We would mm. do a five-year general surgery. Uh, residency and then subspecialize in cardiac and thoracic surgery. So cardiac, obviously all things dealing with the heart, mm -hmm. thoracic, the lungs, the esophagus. So there's a completely separate subset of what we do, the thoracic component. component. From the cardiac standpoint and nowadays, mm -hmm. there's actually a big fusion of, of all of our specialties. So I think we, we, we speak more of our specialties here on, on, right. this, uh, on this panel. I think um, we spoke about what historically the training has been. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the future because so many of our uh, therapies, of our uh, decision making has now become uh, really a team approach. Um, but historically, we're mechanics. And okay. so the, the diagnostics, the testing up front would come from the very smart cardiologists who have looked at all of those things, worked them up, and we used to be the sort of the end user, the, the end of the road. I, I think nowadays there, there's a you lot more interaction. You used to be the end user, interestingly said. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, but no, there's, there's a lot more, like you said, when you're talking about intervention, and you're right. I mean, I, I feel like every February often we, f we focus on cardiology and heart because it's heart month. Um, and it's always a complete different program. And I don't know if the audience can see this, I don't even know if they care, but these are the shows that we've had over the last like eight or nine years. Because what I do with my research, I research what's new, frequently asked questions on every site that I can find, and then I go back and see, okay, what were those questions three years ago? And they're, they're hugely different from what I'm talking about, especially when in your area, when you're talking about surgery, just the different ways that you can go in to the chest and fix stuff. And in the old days, it was like, oh, he had a whole open heart surgery, which means the ribs had to be cracked open. And yeah. so it's beautiful that you said that because I am gonna ask some future questions toward the end of the show. So what I try to do in this program is about 10 or 15 minutes before the end of the program, I'm gonna stop questions from the audience and really focus on what the three of you wanna talk about. And that way we really have an idea of, okay, before I was driving over here, I wanted to make sure I got A, B, and C in. I wanna make sure you get all of that in. So one of my first questions here is when we're talking about structural heart disease, and Dr. Ostey, you were talking about what the function of the heart is. Mm -hmm. So structurally, and I don't know if that's something that you all consider you're born with an issue this way, because I, I think of structurally as something that um, it wasn't caused by a heart attack or it wasn't caused by something, it's a structural issue. How would you describe structural heart disease? <clears throat> well, unlike what 
we've always thought about when we talk about the heart is kind of the plumbing and the electricity of the heart. So mm -hmm. when people have heart attacks, it's from a clogged artery. Everyone's very familiar with that, but structural heart disease has evolved very rapidly in, in the treatment of it. It's okay. always been there, Okay. but the treatment of it has changed dramatically in the last five to 10 years. So when we think about structural heart disease, it's relaying mostly to your heart valves, which mm -hmm. are inside the heart, part of the heart chambers and the communication between the chambers. All of those types of factors can be treated now either surgically, which has been the tradition, versus doing some types of techniques which we call percutaneous techniques where we're entering the body from the outside and using catheter-based therapy mm -hmm. to treat these problems with the structure. So one of the most common structural heart diseases is valvular problems such as aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be mitral valve issues, there can be a, a uh, communication between two chambers. There's a very common arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. where people are predisposed to stroke mm -hmm. and there's a little pouch that is part of the structure of the heart that can now be closed either surgically or percutaneously mm -hmm. to prevent people from having a stroke. Talk to me a little bit more about that. So number one, and a lot of the audience knows this about me, I, I, I'm very long and I grew quickly within a year's time. So my doctors have said, you know, your soft tissue didn't catch up and so I have uh, mitral valve prolapse. It does have some regurgitation. It's chronic, but to this point, benign. So that's something I'm always interested in. Um, yes, AFib, I've got that. Is it related to a heart valve? Yes, I, it is. Uh, so I think that that's not uncommon in this day and age because you hear ads about this all the time, right? And I figure if there's advertising, it means a lot of people have this issue, which means there's money to be made and that's why there's advertising. When you talk about this pouch, Tell me a little bit more about that, because that's new for me to hear that. So, and, and feel free, <coughs> any of you to jump in, because I know as a surgeon too, you can talk about closing it surgically, you mm -hmm. said, so feel mm -hmm. free to jump in anywhere as well. Well, the appendage, it's called the okay. left atrial appendage. The left atrial, okay. Yeah, left atrial appendage, which is on the upper chamber of the heart, and basically that appendage is responsible for 90% of clot formation. No kidding. 90% yeah. of clot formation. 90% of formation. clot formation occurs Goodness. there, which is the predisposing factor that causes strokes in atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation is such a prevalent disease in, you know, as we get older, right. um, that we have traditionally treated the prevention of clot formation and stroke with the use of drug pharmacotherapy. Mm -hmm. That's why there's all these advertisements on TV about these medications that, that prevent stroke. Mm -hmm. And there have been great advances in those medicines to make it easier on patients. But for patients that cannot take mm -hmm. these blood thinners, there's now a procedure that can be done, again, percutaneously or catheter-based to okay. try and occlude it. Or if the patient is undergoing open heart surgery for maybe bypass surgery, mm -hmm. getting their blood vessels, bypass, Dr. Flores at the same time can also take care of that little pouch mm -hmm. to help that patient from having a future stroke if they have this known history of atrial fibrillation. So Dr. Flores, taking care of the pouch, are you closing it up? Are you, what are, what are you doing physiologically when you take care of the pouch, so to speak? Yeah. That could be, could be new, the catchphrase. On That's the a great show. question. It's a great question because it depends on your approach. So from okay. the surgical approach, when we're doing it and we, uh, we have full exposure to the heart, uh, what we'll do is that we, the latest therapies uh, have been to exclude that atrial appendage by placing a clip over it. That clip is pushed down to the base of the left atrial appendage, and there's excellent data with the use of these clips. Uh, there are some folks who will actually ligate the, the bottom part, mm -hmm. close it up either with suture. Uh, there are some folks who have advocated cutting it off, hmm. uh, but that increases the potential bleeding risk, as right, you might imagine. Right. The clip right now is the gold standard, I think, for, for eliminating the left atrial appendage, excluding it. Now, the percutaneous therapies are a little bit different because mm -hmm. obviously you don't have that exposure. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's very interesting in that you actually go in through the venous side, 
through the femoral vein most okay. of the time. Get a catheter up into the right atrium and then cross, create a, a connection between the right and left side of the heart. You go from the right atrium to the left atrium and then there's a device called the Watchman device and that Watchman device then gets deployed through that catheter mm -hmm. into the left atrial appendage. Uh, that takes a little bit longer. Deployed to meaning that it stays open. there? Or yeah, it opens and it stays and there it permanently. It opens and it stays there. Mm -hmm. So you anchor okay. it into the left atrial appendage, anchor it in, and, uh, and then hmm. the, the decrease in flow in the left right. atrial appendage actually causes it most of the time to thrombose, ironically. Yeah, okay. so it's excluded. Uh, endothelium will grow uh, over, that, over that device. And, uh, and then blood can't flow in, into Endothelium, it Endothelium, is that a fancy word for scar tissue? It is, okay. yeah, scar right. tissue so in, just, of the inside of the heart. In my head, I'm just trying to figure out, so you're, because your body then is trying to protect or just do whatever it needs to, to do there, so it kind of keeps it then in place after Correct. a couple of months, I guess. Yeah, once you exclude okay. the flow and you provide that matrix of that device in okay. there, uh, there's clot formation and endothelium that should form over it, or scar tissue that forms over it. So, and, and I know everybody's different, once this procedure is done, can you tell within a couple of days? Can you tell right away that the AFib is, is not fixed? So, That's the wrong well, the, word. Yeah, it, the AFib is a, different, uh, is a different beast. So okay. the atrial fibrillation, okay. there, there are definitely treatments for So this is stroke AFib. prevention that we're this talking about. This is 100% stroke prevention. Yeah. Gotcha. And where okay. you really want to think about it is in someone who, for X, Y, or Z reason, uh, they have atrial fibrillation, you think their stroke risk is higher. The treatment for a long time has been to anticoagulate those folks, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. that the anticoagulation will decrease your yearly stroke risk. Right. There are, there are patients who, A, don't want to take anticoagulation, right. although that, that's probably a, a soft indication for it, but patients who cannot have anticoagulation. And so in those folks, mm -hmm. uh, rather than continue to take anticoagulation where maybe it's increasing bleeding from another right, part of the body, right. then, uh, then these procedures should be, should be uh, part of yeah, what's offered. Yeah, an mm -hmm. idea of, of an option. Nicely said, and I know, you know just several people too, the bruising, just the, yeah, whole nother subject. Yeah. So, Dr. <coughs> Mendez, I'm gonna come to you now and I'm gonna look at you as, you're gonna be the everything guy, you're interventional guy, and I, I remember that about you too. So, when we're looking at Prevention may or may not be a right word here because I think that most people would have to present with an issue for you to uh, take a look at them, right? Um, but say now that you have a patient that comes to you from uh, an internal med doc and you, what are some of the common things that patients come to you with that you're thinking, oh, I can interventionally, I can kind of help prevent what may be coming down the road. What are some of the common things that you hear about on that? So, um, <coughs> When we're talking about interventional cardiology and what right. we do on a regular basis, right. the, uh, we're mostly talking about catheter-based therapies. Okay. And catheter-based therapies now have expanded, uh, whereas the main original intent or, or uh, training of the specialty was to treat heart attacks and treat uh, clogged arteries, mm -hmm. has now expanded, as Dr. Asi had mentioned, into treating valves mm -hmm. and into treating left atrial appendages, like Dr. Flores said. Right. So, so, that, so that's what's expanded into. Um, so patients that are, that are referred to us that we believe are appropriate for an intervention are usually patients who have a heart attack. And those are patients that are gonna get an intervention like, right. like an acute myocardial infarction where a blood vessel has suddenly closed. And that's where we are probably one of the most useful things we do mm -hmm. is uh, unclog the artery on a, on a timely basis so that the blood can get, blood flow can be reestablished and improve the patient's prognosis significantly. Exactly, so, so you're not only saving the person right then and there, you're also preventing more issues in the, in the future. That is correct. Okay. And, and then we have the, the catheter-based therapies for other things like valvular disease. Mm -hmm. And in this case, let's, uh, placing the example of transcatheter aortic valve replacement, mm -hmm. a patient who is found to have aortic stenosis, which is a disease of the aortic valve, mm -hmm. uh, where the valve doesn't open normally for a variety of reasons, um, has typically been evaluated uh, to undergo an open aortic valve replacement by a, by a surgeon like Dr. Flores. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, patients are very high risk to mm -hmm. undergo open heart surgery or maybe equivalent risk 
And then uh, we come in as a team and make a decision on what uh, the appropriate therapy is for the patient. And obviously patient preference take right, exactly. goes into account. So, and so that, that's also another uh, way we, we do sort of interventional mm -hmm. approach to, but there's many. Uh, uh, as Dr. Asi has said, some uh, people are born with a little hole inside their hearts mm -hmm. uh, be in between the chambers mm -hmm. and the back chambers of the heart called an atrial septal defect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, over time, this uh, may in, uh, when uh, patients are young, it may not be a problem. It right. may not even cause a heart murmur or any symptoms. We but as the heart ages, they have that unless they, there's a they, reason to look at it. They may not know they have okay. it. Many times it's diagnosed until the people are in their 50s, 60s. Okay. And many times it doesn't need to be close because it's asymptomatic and it does not cause any. It does does not have any consequence. Mm -hmm. But in some patients, as the heart ages, mm -hmm. it it can be. Mm -hmm. It can, and and that's when we come in and and uh, evaluate that again. That can be closed uh, surgically, mm -hmm. but also percutaneously. And if uh, there are symptoms, uh, what would those be? And I'll ask you the same thing with different valves, because we've got aortic valve issues and mitral valve issues. I mean, they're, they're two very different beasts, as I understand. Um, next time, I want to have this really big graphic so we can point at things. But let's talk about the, the, the individual has a hole in the heart and has since they were born. And now they're 57, 58 years old, and they're feeling, what would they be feeling like? Oh, I'm feeling, I got to go talk to my doc about what? Well, uh, Specifically tired. talking about uh, natural septal defects, for example. Um, and if they, they have uh, no idea that they've they, got this going and on. They, and they have no idea. Right. Shortness of breath is typically the first symptom that they may uh, have. Occasionally, they will have palpitations mm. because the communication may predispose the patient to have uh, heart rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that is a, uh, that those are usually the, typically the symptoms. Um, in rare cases, a patient can present with a stroke. If a patient has a stroke uh, that we believe it may have been co not caused by that little hole, but maybe a blood clot that formed in the veins, in the veins of the, uh, of the person, mm -hmm. it could have traveled from the veins in the legs all the way into the heart, <coughs> across that hole, and out, into the, and out to the brain. <coughs> and that's been documented to happen, so it's not common. It's, uh, it's rare, but it can happen, and that's another indication for closure. I'm going to apologize because I feel like I'm going to have a coughing fit. So I'm swallowing, but Dr. Ossi, <clears throat> my questions to you are, if we can talk about the different chambers and the different valves of the heart, in that, again, I have mitral valve prolapse, and it, it's, again, relatively benign. It's chronic. It's there. We're to watch it. AFib is associated with that. However, the aortic valve seems to be like a much more important valve. So if you can kind of explain, I'm sorry, <clears throat> if you can kind of explain to the audience what valves are doing <coughs> what and why they're so different in the different chambers. Does that sure. make sense, what yeah. I'm asking? Okay. Absolutely, <coughs> and I, I would say that the aortic valve is the... <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like the mitral valve, the mitral. whatever. It's just mitral valve. You, you don't want to hurt another I valve's feelings here. Stepchild <laughs> that we want to ignore. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, they're all important. You have four valves mm -hmm. in the heart. You have two right-sided valves and two left-sided valves. Okay. And in adulthood, the left-sided valves are definitely the more important valves because they're the ones that typically manifest as we get older. And they typically, the two most common forms of valve disease in this country are aortic stenosis mm -hmm. and mitral regurgitation. And the regurgitation could be related to mitral valve prolapse, it could be related to a heart attack, it could be related to just thickening of the valve leaflets over time and that one of those cords tears and can create mitral regurgitation. But the, in, as we all get older, those are probably the two most common valves that create major issues for patients. Okay. Symptom-wise, the aortic valve, typically the early manifestations of aortic valve are really just shortness of breath mm -hmm. and decreased exercise tolerance. Fatigue. You know, and that's so hard to, is, and I'm just thinking about everybody out there, it's like, yeah, I ran those two flights of stairs and I guess I just haven't been exercising for a while. And that's why I'm asking about symptoms because sometimes you just think, oh, I'm just out of shape. And it, Maybe this is, this is our way of saying, go see your doctor every year, get everything checked out every year, because maybe it's not just the fact that you're out of shape. And I don't know 
again, what doctors and Dr. Flores, it looks like you want to say something, but I don't know if, if people come to you or patients come to you and just thought, ah, oh, well, this has been going on for three years. I just thought I was out of shape. What do you hear from your patients? Well, I'll tell you, in, in the spirit of Heart Month, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, one of the most important reasons why we're all here is, is that we want to educate folks about what those symptoms are and not just chalking it up to age. There's definitely an age uh, a linear relation between aortic stenosis as we see it in, mm -hmm. in non-congenital types, just sort of your run-of-the-mill aortic stenosis and age. And so it's easy to say, well, I'm just getting a little older and, and maybe that's why I'm more short of breath or my exercise tolerance isn't what it is. Having said that, there are statistics that say that 20 to 40 percent of people with aortic stenosis are undiagnosed or undertreated. Mm -hmm. And so 40 percent is, is nothing to, to blow off, right? I, right. I think it's important to realize that if you're having those kinds of symptoms, right. that, that you should see your doctor, as, as you said. And you don't want your first occurrence of the symptoms to be a heart attack yeah, or a stroke. Or advanced stage aortic stenosis. Unfortunately, aortic stenosis carries with it a, a very poor prognosis. Mm -hmm. uh, if you become symptomatic, uh, you know, there are three classic symptoms uh, of aortic stenosis. One is syncope, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, we've all experienced getting up from a chair and, and feeling like you're gonna pass out. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but if it's solitarily related to your aortic stenosis, uh, then your prognosis becomes a, a coin toss at right. five years. If you have chest pain mm -hmm. and it's solitarily related to aortic stenosis, your prognosis becomes 50% at two years. And if you have heart failure uh, and associated pulmonary edema, uh, which is really fluid backing up into the lungs because of that decreased function because of the aortic stenosis, mm -hmm. your prognosis is 50% at six months. Oh, geez. So this is why right. it's so, so important, it's important to diagnose to, yeah. this and treat it because the, the window then becomes smaller. You have an older person mm -hmm. who's having symptoms and is at the end of a curve that looks a whole lot more like this right. than it does like this. Right. So bottom yeah. line at the end of the day, yes, go ahead. Well, I, I just want to emphasize mm -hmm. something that you said mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, I was, I get out of breath walking two flights of stairs or climbing two flights of stairs and I just think it's my that is the number one reason why people end up progressing to mm. the late stages mm -hmm. and late manifestations is that they overlook what they're feeling right and it's key as the primary care physician or the cardiologist to you know interrogate patients and really figure out are you stopping what you're doing because you're just feeling like it's just part of my aging process. Right. But those early manifestations of these valve diseases are very, very important because you don't want to wait to the point where Dr. Flores is talking about when you've developed heart failure and you have to act immediately. Right, exactly. Um, and that was kind of at the point, at the end of the day, just go to your doctor and let them know what's going on. And, and I've heard this too, it's like, well, I don't want to be a wuss because then, 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 well, go be a wuss, go tell your doctor what's going on and let the doctor kind of make that decision. But at the same time too, um, I say this out loud to the audience because there's caretakers, right? Sometimes mom's up there and she's out of breath and she don't want to do anything about it so maybe the kids can kind of help out so there's there's you yourself but sometimes your best advocate is a person that's around you and make that be someone that helps too when we were talking about valves dr flores i'm going to ask you really quick um and then we'll we'll move on so valve replacements we've talked about that several times and i know that there if the common valve is still the pig valve and for a while mechanical valve maybe that's still a big thing what what is the trend is the wrong word but yeah. what are some of the options now so th there are still mechanical valves okay. and those are made out of heat and pressure treated carbon so it's as strong as a diamond mm -hmm. and and those valves uh, are are almost primarily used in younger patients okay um, I think the only thing less des desirable than having heart surgery is having two heart surgeries. Right. And so if you're a young person, you're in your 40s, you're in your 50s, and, and we know that the average American lives to be 80, well, if you're going to have a heart valve put in, you, you probably want to have a heart valve that's going to last 20, 30, right. potentially 40 years. The, the chance that a mechanical valve, uh, that's the carbon valves, that they will deteriorate structural valve deterioration is less than 1%. I mean, ah, those valves okay. have no enemies except one, and that's that you have to take anticoagulation. Okay. Your blood knows what carbon looks like, and it likes to, it wants to 
set up a clot, right, it, it, as soon mm. as your blood comes into contact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, those patients will have to take anticoagulation long term. That hasn't really changed, and uh, the risk of bleeding from anticoagulation is about 2% per year. Okay. So that, that has to be taken into consideration as well. But in young patients, I think that's still the gold standard. Where, where, the, where the trend, if anything, is changing is what to do on patients who are 60, uh, really from that 55 to 60 year old range mm -hmm. where we have these bioprosthetics. Mm -hmm. And the bioprosthetic valves are made out of the tissue of an animal, be, mm -hmm. be it a cow or a pig. And uh, those valves can last anywhere between 15 to 20 years in that subset of patients. Okay. But eventually, they will fail because they're made out of a, an animal that sacrificed, volunteered exactly. his life so that we could live a little longer. Life. Yeah. And, uh, and your body will tear those valves down. And yeah. that's whether those valves are placed uh, percutaneously, you know, transcatheter, or surgically. Um, those valves have the benefit of not requiring anticoagulation, mm -hmm. but, but again, their structural valve deterioration rate is, is real. Nice. Um, not nice, but uh, well explained. I, our wonderful production team, way to go guys, um, has just informed me that they have a nice graphic of a heart, of a structural heart, so I'd like for the three of us to kind of look at what we're looking at oh. home. So of the things that we've already spoken, uh, spoken about here this evening, any one of the three of you can look at, in fact, I have to put my eyeglasses on because I can't see that very well. Um, Dr. Ossie, since I charged you, in the very beginning of what the heart is supposed to do. We're looking at the chambers, we're looking at a couple of valves there. Um, you wanna say anything about this great picture? Other than the fact that it's a single ventricle. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, 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 a reptile heart. But it gives us a little bit more than Speaking we had like three seconds <laughs> ago. Um, am I able to point to anything or? Uh, no, unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, oh yeah, well we could do this. I don't know if this guy's gonna, Project one. Yeah, he he may not be. Um, this is this is my favorite little heart. I always feel like it's too small, but if we don't have anything, it might be nice to. Well, it will be this camera here. There we go. That will be able to look at it. So. Are you, you able to zoom up camera. on it? Oh, this sorry. It'd be the, it would be this one over here. My apologies. It's okay. The camera in the middle that has the has the light on it. So when we look at the heart, basically, as I was telling you before, there's left-sided and right-sided. And this is the main pumping chamber called the left ventricle. This is the main pumping chamber on the right called the right ventricle, which pumps blood to the lungs. And then the oxygenated blood comes into the upper chamber of the left side called the left atrium, where that little pouch sits. And it's not depicted here on this model, but that pouch sits right up on top. The left atrium then dumps blood into the left ventricle through the mitral valve. From there, the, the left side of the heart, the left ventricle pumps blood out the aortic valve, which is sitting right there. Mm -hmm. ah, there you go. Yeah. Right there, it's that tricuspid valve right there. That, that valve opens up and allows blood to go up into the aorta, which then circulates to the brain and all of our organs. And then that whole system, the venous blood comes through the right side, goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, and then out the pulmonic valve, which then goes to the lungs. And those are the four chambers of the heart and the four valves. Okay. Nicely said. And, and, and again, we've just kind of had this up here. Um, we have, we're starting to get so many questions here from the sure. audience. So we are at a little bit less than a 30 minute mark. So I'm going to start throwing these out to you guys and then we will circle back around. Um, I've not read these yet. These are, this is a cold read. My husband's blood pressure. See, a wife has been listening. <laughs> My husband, husband, husband. Good job. Good job. My husband's blood pressure is always high. He takes all his medications, but it's still high. What should he do? So we can talk a little bit about, again, disclaimer, this is all we have to go on. Uh, you're covered legally. The beginning of the show says all the opinions are yours. You're good. So, um, Let's talk about blood pressure. We were talking about structural issues earlier. We we're talking about all kinds of things that can lead to high blood pressure. There's lifestyle things. In general, I feel like that's cholesterol and high blood pressure, right? Are those two the big things? Asi, I'm looking at you because you're right next to me. Um, <laughs> medications, you were talking about medications in general for AFib and other things, but for high blood pressure, what might that be? Well, I mean, high blood pressure is something that if you had to say what is the cause of high blood pressure 
really in 95 to 98 percent of the population, the true cause of high blood pressure is really not known. There's not a, mm. something that you can pinpoint and say this is why you have high blood pressure. It often affects as we, again, get older, mature, our vessels stiffen, and right. that, that uh, blood pressure becomes an issue because blood pressure predisposes us to heart attacks, strokes, it can affect the heart muscle. So treating it is extremely important. And obviously lifestyle changes such as dietary restriction of sodium, regular exercise program are all extremely important. Then you get pharmacotherapy, which you need medications to help most people control their right, blood pressure. Exactly. And there's several lines of medications out there that we use to treat people with high blood pressure. In someone who is on multiple medications for high blood pressure and has not been responsive, mm -hmm and they adhere to a good lifestyle, watch their sodium intake, sometimes then we start thinking about that other two to three percent of the population that may have a reason, an undiagnosed reason I why see. you have right. high blood pressure. Okay. Kidney artery blockage is mm -hmm. a common, not a common, but one of the things that can occur in a situation such as that. And always look into the, the extra things that are going on. Um, and there's it, some genetics run into that as well. I mean, there are some people that I know that are, have been athletes all their lives and the high blood pressure is way up here. So you got to pick your parents well. You, you got to yeah. pick your parents well. <laughs> Don't tell my kids that, but you're right. Um, Dr. Mendez, let me give this one to you. Symptoms of a stroke and or heart attack. Number one, what are the differences? Number two, what should I do? That's the oh. bingo question right oh, there, wow. right? So yeah. maybe we can talk about symptoms of a heart attack because sometimes, sometimes people don't know they're having a heart attack, right? Exactly. And sometimes people don't know that they're having a stroke. So this actually is a, is a good question. And again, yeah. feel free to pop in either both, both of yeah. those. Well. So we can talk about symptoms of a heart attack first and then we can go to stroke. So symptoms of a heart attack, the typical symptom that has been known to, to everybody and that's, that pretty much mo everybody knows or uh, uh, is uh, chest pain mm -hmm. and uh, chest pain has been described typically in uh, as pain in the center of the chest or on the left side that sometimes goes up to the jaw or the neck sometimes to the back associated with shortness of breath or sweating mm -hmm. those were the classical symptoms that every medical student is taught about a heart attack in reality most people have variations of that or have no chest pain sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, some people may have pain in the upper abdomen, what we call the epig epigastric pain. Other people only have shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have heart attacks without symptoms, but that's more rare. Right. It's not common, <laughs> but it happens. Uh, it tends to happen more in the elderly, uh, especially it can happen also in diabetics, especially diabetics who have already damage to their nervous system mm -hmm. because of the diabetes they they have poor sensation of their internal organs or even uh, externally too so they they have decreased sensation so they can they may not feel pain but most people feel something right shortness of breath chest pain epigastric and that's pain also sometimes neck to pain ignore. sometimes right. pain I mean in the back in, in the middle of the back in the center of the back or in right. the left upper back that that can happen too so symptoms of a, of a heart attack are variable, but it's some variation of mm -hmm, those. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you have those and you suspect or feel a sensation that things are going wrong, you have to go to the hospital because the sooner you get there, uh, the quicker you get treatment, the better you'll do. Yeah, time is magic, right? If I remember that. I mean, yeah, if no you yeah. can get within any kind of treatment an hour, half an hour is even better. Yeah. Um, nicely explained on that. Dr. Asi? I just want to add one mm -hmm. thing. You know, I often tell, ask my patients, have you had any chest pain? But when you say pain, sometimes people think of it as like a real severe sharp pain, but I mean pressure, pressure. discomfort, right. squeezing sensation in the chest, feeling like something is on top of your chest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't equate that as saying, I'm really having pain. Right, exactly. It's a yeah. discomfort, uncomfortableness. Mm -hmm. And any of those types of symptoms, as Dr. Mendez was explaining, are, you know, need to be evaluated. I think right. somebody explained it once on a cardiac show, is that if it just feels like it's taking your breath away, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's not, it's just like, okay, something's going on. It's just, it's just not right, if, if we can put it that way. Um, so let's go to, because I have a cu couple of questions here on stroke too. So now let's talk about... Let's talk about stroke symptoms when you're alone 
and stroke symptoms that somebody else might be able to say, oh, you might be having a stroke. So that's two different things too, because sometimes you just don't know either, right? And yeah. if you can go. Exactly. So the stroke is a completely different situation. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about a stroke, we talk about most commonly a, a blockage of a blood vessel that goes to the brain mm -hmm. and that part of the brain uh, has suffered some sort of damage, um, and which can lead to even death of the brain cells, of the neurons. And, um, but it, so, you know, in, in, uh, in common language, a stroke may be other things too, like uh, a bleeding inside the brain. Mm -hmm. a, uh, the whole ischemic stroke versus, versus hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic stroke, stroke et, yeah, et right. cetera. Right. So, so <laughs> symptoms of a stroke, they're very variable because the, the brain essentially control, has the ability to control many parts of your body or pretty much every, essentially everything. So, uh, but the ones that are more obvious or more that can be concerning is paralysis, mm -hmm. loss of function of one part of your body versus another. Mm -hmm. So uh, paralysis of one arm, paralysis of one leg, paralysis of both, paralysis of half of the face. Mm -hmm. uh, usually symptoms of a stroke tend to happen on more on one side but they can happen on both sides also. Um, sometimes people don't notice and a uh, right, family and member notices question, that right. their, their face is drooping on right. one side mm -hmm. and not the other. And that can be a symptom of a stroke. And uh, the stroke, it, uh, getting to an emergency room when you have symptoms of a stroke immediately is mm -hmm. very, very important because timely treatment makes a very big difference. And that's, that's the case with so many different things. Um, question here from the audience, and Dr. Flores, I'm gonna send this your way. Um, can the docs on the panel explain a little bit more about nodes, about electrical activity in the heart? And then it says bundle branch blocks. We haven't talked about ablation this evening. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that could be part of that, but it's just a question from the audience of just talking about the electrical issues of the heart. Sure. Uh, that is a, a big beast, and, yeah. and it's become a completely, uh, if not separate, at, at least a, a, a very specialized area of cardiology. And, uh, and that's because uh, just like the electrical system in this room is behind the walls, mm, well, the mm -hmm. electricity and the, the nerves that conduct it in the heart are within the walls of the heart. And uh, we all know that the atria and the ventricle beat uh, synchronously, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a whole lot that goes into that because electricity travels so quickly that where the electricity is generated in the sinoatrial node, one of the two nodes, is up at the top of the heart. Well, that'll generate electricity that runs, oh yeah, let's go to Old Faithful here. Good job, here. Dr. Mendez. Right. So Please right on top, the, the SA node, the sinoatrial node. We can get someone to operate this camera here. Lives uh, uh, almost speaking. at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. Okay. That sinoatrial node will generate the, okay. the uh, electrical signal, the normal electrical signal, it travels across the atria. Electricity travels extremely fast. Right. And so if you just shot electricity from the top of the heart, that electrical signal could run through the heart, almost, through the entire heart almost immediately. Well, you don't want your atria and your ventricle to squeeze at the same time. Mm -hmm. that, that, would, that would not lead that to a, not a forward right. beat. Exactly. And so there has to be something that slows down that electricity between the atria and the ventricle, and that's the atrioventricular node. Okay. It will literally slow down that electricity just enough to allow the atrium to, con to contract completely, empty its blood into the ventricle, the ventricle to receive it, and then the electricity passes from the AV node through very specialized fibers so across the septum. So how does the heart know to do this? I, this is a second grader question, yeah. right? So um, d your body just knows that this is a time we got, we got to slow, we got, we got to fix something that's going on here? Well, this, this is ele electricity that's inherent okay. to the heart. Okay. So there are, there are different things that will drive how fast your heart beats and mm -hmm. how quickly that SA node is generating the initial impulse. Mm -hmm. But every impulse, whether it's generated at rest, exercise, you're getting attacked by a giant lion, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. those, those impulses are generated through the SA node and then have to be transmitted through the AV node. It will slow them down mm -hmm. so that the ventricle can absorb uh, or uh, take in the blood from the atria, right. and then it beats. It, it's, it's elegant. This is what, yeah, it's elegant. That's a mm -hmm. beautiful word. I mean, the way our bodies are so interconnected, and you talked about you're being attacked by a lion, right? That's totally psychological. Mm -hmm. But then how does that physiologically affect the body? So this is where I get excited. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're running out of time, so I want to go here again. Not a lot of information on here, but I, I, I 
dig the question. I do not have high blood pressure. I do not have high cholesterol. I don't have a high blood sugar. I'm in great shape, but I had a heart attack. Why? I'm 76 years old. I know you can't answer, answer this question, but what would you say to this person? Yeah. Uh, whoever, who would like to have it? Doc uh, man, can, Dr. Mendez, go for you. it. I mean, it's, we've, uh, over the last 70 years, uh, cardiology has advanced so much that we, we have a very good idea of the main risk factors of pe for people to develop a heart attack, right? right? Hypertension, diabetes, <laughs> they were all mentioned there. Um, but then we're missing one that's not there, that's family history. Um, and uh, that may entail several things. And even people who don't have family history can, si can still have mm -hmm. Uh, coronary disease, which what is what leads to a heart attack, um, uh, because there are things that we still don't know, right. risk factors that we still have not identified completely, and there's risk factors that are what we call in the works that the societies are looking at to to decide whether it's something that we need to be testing everybody or just a certain amount of, or certain group of people. Um, uh, you know, we, you all heard the story of somebody who's in their 30s or 40s mm -hmm. who has a sudden heart attack and mm -hmm. didn't have any disease and before and didn't have any risk factors. But then you start digging, then you find, and so family history would be one. And there's other things, uh, certain lipid particles that are not tested for on a regular basis, like something called lipoprotein A, which uh, I believe it's many of these patients that don't have any risk factors if they test test themselves for that, that, mm -hmm. that tends to be positive. Not everybody. And obviously, right. if they don't, you know, smoking also is very important. That was not mentioned there, but that's yeah. also a significant And then factor. sometimes, and I don't, even, I don't remember what show it was, but it just struck me. When there is a question like this that comes up, the doctor on the show said, well, sometimes it's just a God question. And sometimes that's, I mean, we know what we know, but we also kind of don't know what we don't know. And I know that's a, a cliche type thing to say, um, but keep doing all the good stuff to prevent the next one from happening. I'm gonna stop all questions from the audience for a bit because we have about 10 minutes before the end of the program. What I'd like to do, um, and Dr. Ossie, I'll start with you. I'd like to, um, whatever you feel like we haven't really covered this evening yet, or if there's something that, um, we haven't mentioned at all or something you want to touch more base on. I'm just going to ask all three of you the exact same thing. What might that be? Well, I, I think that being Heart Month, we have to go back to we're all here to take care of people, right, and their disease processes. But I think the main goal to stress and emphasize to all patients out there is prevention. Mm -hmm. So this gentleman right here that is exercising, he's right. taking care of himself. I mean, that's that is key in preventing getting to us. I would much rather that our patients see their physician on a regular basis, get their cholesterol checked, adhere to an exercise program, watch your diet so that you don't really need myself or Dr. Mendez in the emergency room taking mm -hmm. care of you for a heart attack, or Dr. Flores to do open heart surgery on you. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the key is always try and do the best that you can with a healthy lifestyle because that clearly will help reduce the chances of you really needing to see us. Right, nicely said. Dr. Mendez, how about you? I think, again, uh, stress what Dr. Assi said about uh, prevention. I think that is very, very important. And yes, even though somebody who doesn't have risk factors and does everything right can still have a heart attack, as you know, was mentioned, it's, uh, it's very important because they, you know, taking care of your, of your risk factors has, uh, will take care of, the, of a significant portion of the risk uh, to, to get to a heart attack. Um, other... Uh, Things that we haven't talked about, uh, I think uh, it's uh, also very important uh, for many patients, especially with uh, valvular heart disease, that they start, um, that they looked at, again, they look at their symptoms again, uh, not as a, uh, as a symptom of uh, getting old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, that's uh, something that happens very frequently is like, uh, my uh, my grandmother, you know, has stopped doing doing her her light yard work like that mm. that she used to do, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, you know, six months ago, mm -hmm. and um, 
and and when I you know I see that she gets more tired, and that may be a symptom of heart disease, mm -hmm. valvular disease in, spe mm -hmm. in specific, and that's something that that sometimes needs to be evaluated again. Discussing that with your primary care physician, having a good physical exam, uh, making sure you have you don't have a murmur, and that you're referred appropriately once once you have disease found. See, and that that's what's so hard. Maybe she just stopped because she you know the weeds can grow a little bit more. It, it's so hard, and I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about this because it's not something to be bypassed, if, if that's the word. Dr. Flores, how about you? Well, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I won't be down on prevention any more than, than the obvious. I think it's so important in seeing your doctor early. What I will tell you, something that we, even sitting here is, is very clear to me, is how exciting it is to be a cardiovascular specialist in El Paso right now. And, and how nice it is uh, really to, as, as technology evolves, uh, as the therapies that we're able to provide for patients, you know, the, the basics, the elemental stuff hasn't changed. Mm. The, 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 the nature of the disease, I, I think our knowledge is what's changing and certainly the technology that's being pumped into how we're able to treat it uh, is very, very exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the therapies that we're offering here in El Paso. The collaboration that, that goes on between us more than ever, uh, I think, is, uh, is really all to the benefit of the patient. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's an exciting time to be a cardiovascular specialist, certainly a cardiothoracic surgeon in El Paso. And, and I think it's good for the community. As a yeah, native, and all the I lives love to that see you're it. Saving, you know? And again, we. We will have a similar discussion uh, next year, but it will be very different all at the same time of all the new things that are, that are happening. Um, question here from the audience, and I hope I'm reading this correctly. I was born with an aortic bicuspid valve issue, I believe, and recently mm. needed a pacemaker. I am 56 years old. Does this have to do anything with my bicuspid valve? So I guess we were talking about earlier in the show, structural issues. Uh, what is a bicuspid valve is the question from the audience, and what do I need to do from here? Again, so, kind of a loaded question. Yeah. Who wants yeah. it? Yeah, yeah I, I can Dr. Mendes, start go for it. We okay. can keep going. So if you go back to the model, it, it's sort of small, but you can see when you are born with a bicuspid aortic valve, the bicuspid aortic valve normally has, can you focus on it? I think they're working on it, yeah. Yeah. So if you see the aortic valve here, you can see, oh, there we go. There you go, perfect. So three, three little leaflets right there. And so people who are born with a bicuspid aortic valve um, are born with two leaflets instead of three, or two out of those three leaflets are partially fused. And uh, that's uh, actually a fairly common uh, congenital anomaly, um, you know, uh, and uh, many times it doesn't manifest itself until later in life, in mm -hmm. their 50s, 60s. Uh, we've had patients up until the s their 70s mm -hmm. also. Um, but it can also start in the, in, in f uh, for people in their 30s. And it can manifest uh, in one of two ways, mm -hmm. with the aortic valve not opening normally, aortic stenosis, right. or not closing normally and leaking towards the left ventricle. So where blood mm -hmm. is not supposed to come back from the aorta into the left ventricle, and then it does, it, it, uh, it does that when it's insufficient. Okay. And once it becomes severe, then it, it requires treatment. The typical treatment for, in, for a bicuspid aortic valve, when it's become severely diseased, has been over, the, over time surgery, because mm -hmm. it's usually in younger patients, mm -hmm. and it's in patients who you expect that, uh, that whatever we do to fix the valve mm -hmm. is something that's gonna last a long time. Right. So, um, so that's where, uh, always collaboration with, the, with yeah, the surgeons and... Exactly. And I'm gonna throw, I've got another question here, but I'd like Dr. Flores, um, again, just because we've been talking about futuristic and mm -hmm. even five years ago. So, oh my gosh, I'm having surgery is so much less. Now it's like, oh, I'm having surgery. And the reason I'm asking you that is that you're the surgeon on the table. And interventionally, um, and just what surgery used to be compared to what it is now, recovery time, uh, robotic surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe just give a shout out to people who might be scared to death of sure. surgery. Um, yeah, I, I and you, think, you smile, uh, but, no, but it, think, it matters, uh, right? There's so many <laughs> new things that are happening. And there I, is. I don't, not even yeah, five there, years ago. There are, I think um, there is a huge taboo, and, and I'll speak about 
open heart surgery, traditional open heart surgery. There's a huge taboo about heart surgery. Uh, I think uh, everybody will come out of the woodwork and tell you their story. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, people tend to remember the bad a whole lot more than they remember the right. good uh, and as far as their experience. That, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, some of us are guilty, I'll, I'll include myself, in, in saying things like, uh, we're going to crack your chest. And I think that that really doesn't do service to what we do because what we're doing is is an incision, it's not cracking, and, it, and it's not just semantics. I think there's a huge difference. Having said all of that, I, I think that traditional surgery is tolerated better than most people think right. it's going to be if, if, it's, if, it go, if it's uncomplicated, if there are no complications. Uh, unfortunately, most people that need surgery, as we said, there's a linear relation. Just talking about bicuspid valves in general. The, the reason those valves deteriorate faster is because when the good Lord designed us, mm -hmm. I, I have to imagine he put some good thought into the architecture of it. They're, they're supposed to be three leaflets. And those bicuspid leaflets probably have eddy currents. There's turbulence there. Mm. And mm -hmm. just like a river that has eddy currents in it, turbulence, that's where the trash deposits, unfortunately. And so there's a, there's a relationship and, and it's sort of exponential. Right. As, as that turbulence becomes worse, more trash gets deposited, right? And, right. and so the disease process increases. Um, to say that heart surgery isn't dangerous, I, I think it would be a treat for me to be able to say that, but it's inaccurate. I exactly. mean, the reality right. is heart, er, any it's, treatment it's on, the, right. on the heart, <coughs> uh, really any medical treatment period mm -hmm. has its pros and its cons. Mm -hmm. But yes, the therapies are getting better. Yeah. I think our understanding of the disease, our understanding of rehabilitation afterward is much better. And, and the fact that we all work together to, to get patients through, that's become a, a finely tuned machine when there are no complications. Mm -hmm. We can offer the surgeries through sm much smaller incisions than right. what you're probably used to seeing. The right? recovery times are so much better. The recovery times are better. And right. then of course now there's the transcatheter valve therapies like like TAVR, which uh, we touched on earlier. See, we need a whole other show for that. Now we, we've got we really 40 do. seconds left. Ah. Isn't that terrible? I know. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to say again very much a big thank you to Dr. Edward Ossi, to Dr. Jose Mendez, and Dr. Dr. Uh, Hector Flores. We do have the show come on again at pbselpaso.org. You can go on there to watch the show. They have uh, an archive of several shows going back and also at the El Paso County Medical Society site at epcms.com. And thank you again to Lachlan Vo and also to John Pinsky who have been helping us out this evening as the Texas Tech Paul L. School uh, Foster, Paul L. Foster School of Medicine, goodness gracious, who help us out every time. I appreciate you watching. I'm Katherine Berg. Good night.
of El Paso's coolest nerds. Tonight, a matchup between Burgess High School and Radford School. It's time to sharpen your IQ on High Q. To our home audience, every match of Haikyuu is divided into three rounds. Round one is eight minutes of toss-up and bonus questions. Round two is give and take questions. And round three is another eight minutes of toss-up and bonus questions. You had a chance to meet your teams. We're ready to go with our three rounds of questions. Teams, are you ready? Let's Haikyuu your first toss-up question. Pencil and paper ready. Which positive integer, power of five, is closest in value to two raised to the seventh power, given that two to the seventh equals 128? Mona. Three. I'm sorry? Three. That is incorrect. Possible steal here, Burgess. Four. Amira. Four. That is incorrect. We're looking for 125. Next toss-up question. What Greek mythical hero killed the Minotaur and escaped the labyrinth? Bilad. Theseus. That is correct. Your bonus question. What Christian movement founded by George Fox believes in, quote, the light within, end quote, and included among its members the founder of Pennsylvania, William Penn? Quakers. The Quakers. That is correct. Your next toss-up question, pencil and paper ready. What is the perimeter of a rectangle whose area is 24 and whose longer side has a length of six? Amira. 24. That is incorrect. Possible steal Radford. Monarch. 24. That is incorrect. The answer we're looking for is 20. Next toss-up question. What poem, what poem refers to a man named Flynn as a Lulu and is by Ernest Thayer and ends with a line, quote, no joy in Mudville, end quote, after a baseball player strikes out. Antonio. I am the greatest. That is incorrect. Possible steal here, Radford. No answer. Correct answer we're looking for is Casey at the bat. Next toss-up question. What socialist president of Chile was overthrown in a 1973 coup led by Augusto Pinochet? Mona. Allende. That is correct. Your bonus question. What gas which causes the bends in divers reacts with hydrogen to form ammonia in the Haber process and is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere? Nitrogen. 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 That is correct. Your next toss-up question. What man whose death was filmed by Ramsey Orta reportedly said, quote, I cannot breathe, end quote, before 